live trance and prosper. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Howdy, ni hao ma. How you doing there? This is Dr. Brian David Phillips and welcome to Mythnosis. Our webinar today is about Mythnosis. Now, Mythnosis is just a silly way to say we're interested in ecstatic trance and divine life maps. Uh, this is an open Q&A with frank discussion. Frank's not here, so I guess it's Brian's discussion. It's just an open discussion so that you can ask questions if you like at any time. If you're here live, if you're not here live, then you, you can ask questions. I just don't know what they are. But if you are here live, uh, if you uh, write in the comment box on YouTube, then it should show up on my comment tracker and I can respond to it. I don't know how quickly it will show up. From past experience, we've seen that sometimes it slows down really a lot. And so if it's staggered, I apologize for that. For now, that's our best uh, method for this sort of thing. Eventually, I'll figure something out for a better comment tracking. We kind of like the Google Hangouts for the webinars. We used to use another system, uh, another system which was premium, meaning I paid the bucks, uh, and then it just stopped being usable. Uh, and that was a whole lot of frustrating. But the Google Hangouts seems to work okay. Uh, it is, the quality is not as nice as we'd like, so I do uh, record these with my HD camera and then edit in a version that I upload later. And so a lot of folks see the crappy version of the recording and think, wow, these are really crappy. But uh, we do have good quality ones, uh, usually after a couple days, sometimes in the day. But be that as it may, Mythnosis, this seminar, we're going, or webinar, we're going to introduce concepts and methods related to mythic archetypes as life maps. Uh, essentially, we'll be looking at how experiential hypnosis and ecstatic trance can be used to imprint life maps. Uh, the idea of myths people live by uh, has been explored in the work of Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung, as well as others. And in this webinar, we're going to explore how you might imprint such archetypical roles or mythic life maps via ecstatic experience or experiential trance. Now, uh, many of you who are viewing this are already familiar with hypnosis and uh, things like that. But if you're not, go ahead and um, uh, check that out. Uh, check out my webpage for uh, core skills, hypnosis, and things like that. And evidently, Nathan, you can see and hear me now um, because I see that comment 12,000 times. Uh, no, only five. Okay. But you can ask questions if you like, and we'll see how we get going. Now, um, Joseph Campbell's work, some of you are familiar with, and Carl Jung's work. Um, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation in comparative uh, literature at Taiwan, National Taiwan University, um, I took a lot of courses that used Jung. Jung was like my go-to guy. Uh, a lot of folks in my field, they prefer things like Foucault or Freud or Lacan, especially Lacan and Derrida. I swear, every English department in Taiwan has a, or comparative lit program, has a little altar to Derrida, at least when I was getting my PhD. Not so much today, uh, but um, today we're going to do a little bit on Jung, not a lot, and some Joseph Campbell. Now, Joseph Campbell did have a book that, uh, well, okay, it's a, it's a nice compendium piece. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's a throwaway. It's not like his more core text, uh, uh, Myths People Live By, which is actually what inspired me to start exploring hypnotic applications of his ideas and concepts. The idea being that uh, many of us, 
we hear these stories, uh, these mythic tales, and we take them on board uh, when we're young and we start living out the scripts. Now these aren't just myths in terms of the gods and things like that, but in terms of fairy tales. I mean, how many, how many young women do you know who are waiting for Prince Charming to rescue them? Okay, now that's an interesting way to lead your life, uh, but it's not really the best script to lead your life by. Instead, how about become more dynamic and more active in your life? Instead of waiting for Prince Charming, you are the heroine of the story. Don't let someone else be the hero. Um, and other folks have little repetition complexes they go through. Uh, for instance, one of my uh, one of my professors when I was at university uh, had very clearly, very highly respected man, very absolutely uh, a brilliant man. Okay, uh, he did a lot of phenomenological work and has published uh, a few major books on the subject. But he very obviously to others but not to himself, had a bit of a repetition complex. Hi, Nathan. Uh, and that um, repetition complex was uh, essentially he would teach at these very good universities, and they tended to treat him well. But he'd teach for a few years and then move on unexpectedly, often leaving uh, about the halfway mark to the two-thirds wet mark in the second semester of the year. So he'd go and get prepared to teach at another school, which no one at his former school knew he had taken a job with. Um, and even though this, this kind of should blackball you from getting jobs at good universities, but he taught at Princeton, he taught at Harvard, he taught at Thailand, he taught in Taiwan, and then he went back uh, to the U.S. and taught some more. Uh, but he essentially, he just um, went on spring break and didn't come back, uh, which is an odd thing, but it occurred about every five years in his career. That's a repetition complex. He didn't consciously intend to do that. And I had conversations with him both before and after. Uh, it just seemed to happen that way. Well, things like that don't just seem to happen. You've got a script you're running. His script is one of um, uh, not being able to stay in one place, one of fighting against complacency, which was uh, interesting given his other factors of his personality. Okay? Now, he could, if he wished, change that script. Okay, I'm not saying it's magic, uh, although magic is based upon this kind of work. Uh, but uh, one can imprint a new script. Or if you don't, if you don't believe you have a script running, well, one, you're deluding yourself because we all have scripts of some sort that we run. Uh, but he you can choose your life map. You can choose the script that your unconscious runs for you so that instead of one of the... Um, Todorov says there's a limited number of plots and instead of a, a particular plot uh, that comes from myth and legend and fairy tale and Today, myth includes the stories we see in film, television, and gaming. Uh, instead of one of those scripts that leads to a negative result, you can run a script that leads to a positive result, a positive outcome for yourself. So instead of being Rapunzel, trapped in your tower, waiting for some dude to rescue you, you can become a more active variation of that tale. Or another tale completely. Remember the fairy tales. They've been told different ways. 
those Disney stories aren't really the tales that the Grimm's brothers found. Uh, their versions were far more bloody, far more aggressive, and far scarier. You, and um, when we look at myths themselves, if we look at the stories, you can choose aspects of a god or goddess. You don't have to become Loki. I'm Loki. And so as Loki, you run scripts where you're just joking, causing major mayhem and the destruction of the world. You can choose specific tales and run those as your scripts. So you can pick and choose moments in the myth rather than focusing entirely upon particular moments. I mean, I'm sorry, a whole pass. So you don't have to be Loki who goes through all this hell and generates the destruction of the world. You can be Loki from this moment in time where he actually did something right, uh, where his curious sense of humor led to positive results. There aren't that many stories there. And I know, and I use Loki because I know a lot of folks are there because of the Marvel movies. Uh, they're quite taken with Loki, uh, particularly because Tom Hiddleston did a wonderful job. Or uh, the refrain I hear here in Taiwan, he's so cute, he's so cute. Yes, he is. He's so cute. Uh, but he's Loki, okay? And of course, uh, Thor in those films is very heroic and very wonderful and very awesome. He's very powerful and wonderful. Uh, but the Thor of myth might be a little different. He's kind of a red-headed, fiery-tempered dick. Uh, and there are plenty of stories where he is, his dickishness gets him in trouble and it's quite wonderful. Okay. Uh, now we have a question real quick. I'm normally familiar with scripts in a more concise way such as a restaurant script that tells you what to do when you go into a restaurant and in some cases trying to decide if you should be on a cafe script or a restaurant script. Okay. When I'm using script, I'm really meaning more in terms of blueprint. So it's not, it's not specifically this is what you must do, but you're following a plot. You're following a generalized plot. Now I know that Nathan asked that question regarding scripts. He made the comment rather. And uh, his comment comes from an understanding of script in, in a number of ways. Uh, you would also probably, Nathan, I think, be familiar with script in terms of scenario. For instance, in interactive drama or live action role playing, we're given scenarios for our character. That is, uh, we're given um, an outline of this is the sort of person you are and when you react to others you're reacting in this way and many times an interactive dramatist or a live action role playing author or director or a scenarist actually when they write the the character descriptions they're thinking in terms of unconscious scripts this person might this character might play out uh, they probably have some ideas in their mind of this is how they might respond to this kind of person with some plot ideas in there. Now in an interactive drama or LARP live action role playing game you're, you're just given a skeleton of it. In Mythnosis when a person has a life map they're given they give themselves their unconscious gloms on a concept or a myth that somehow seems to be um, tied in. Now, uh, those of you who are having audio la lagging problems, I apologize for that. There's really not a lot I can do right now. My internet says all is awesome. Um, but I can real quick shut this software off. We'll just stop that, and we will stop this, and hopefully that will help. Uh, it might help, it might not. It's really not, I don't know what other people are doing on the line right now. 
Uh, the audio lagging is one reason why I do record, okay, um, separately, so that we don't have the dropouts. Um, it seems to be okay on my system as far as the YouTube Live goes, but you never know. Uh, that is a disadvantage, and some folks, of course, have um, odd internet issues where they live. Uh, I know in the United States, now I know um, a couple other folks who have asked about this, they're not in the United States, and I'm not in the United States, but um, <coughs> when I visit, I am American, I'm from the U.S., but when I visited the U.S., uh, uh, that's the only country I consistently have uh, cell phone coverage problems. Uh, I was in India and had fewer problems with my cell phone coverage than Los Angeles, for instance, which are really weird, uh, particularly given some obvious things about that. Okay, so your scripts are really, they're, they're maps, but they're not... They're not like a theater script that tells you everything you must do. There's going to be some leeway, um, but that leeway often leads us to um, repetition in how we handle conflict or new experiences. And so we can choose scripts to follow. Now I'd like to, uh, while we're on it, uh, go to an outline that um, some of you are familiar with, which is the monomyth. The monomyth is from Joseph Campbell's observations, and a little bit of Jung does the same thing, but uh, Campbell's observations are the ones that we most often think of in terms of all this. And that's the, the monomyth. Okay, hold on a second. I'm going to sneeze. Oh, I made it. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that was fun. All right, so the monomyth, Campbell, Campbell observed myths from many different cultures, and he postulated that one reason certain stories are very popular is because they follow this outline. Now, keep in mind that, that not all stories, not all myths follow the monomyth model, uh, but many do. And Campbell called it the hero's journey. Now there are folks who use the hero's journey as a therapeutic intervention. That they use this script or life map to help folks through issues in their own life. And hypnotically or through ecstatic trance, we can do a form of deep trance identification with myth, or we can follow this path and run folks through a therapeutic intervention where you have them create an unconscious metaphor following that myth. And so, unconsciously, we know the monomyth essentially has um, well, it essentially has 12 stages, okay? And uh, there are different... Campbell... When we talk about Campbell, it's important to understand that he didn't just write one book and that was it. He was done with it. Uh, he followed the monomyth through, throughout his life. He wrote several books. And so his model did tweak and change a little bit um, over time. Um, but essentially... The concept can be broken down into uh, 12 stages, okay? Now, Christopher Vogler um, wrote some really nice takes on using that for screenplay. And if you're an interactive dramatist, I would encourage you to look at Vogler's version of the writer's journey of using Christopher Vogler, uh, using the monomyth for screenplays. You can also use that for ideas with your interactive dramas. Uh, but in terms of hypnotic or trance work intervention, let's go with the 12 stages. Okay, so stage one, we've got the ordinary world, which is the person as they are now. And then they have this call to adventure uh, where they are given a call, a herald comes, and they are asked to go on this adventure. T 
typically people refuse the call. Okay, and that's the cognitive dissonance going on. Their refusal of the call to change. And so we then have a meeting with the mentor, which is often an older person, a wiser person, but metaphorically it stands for the higher self. That is the superego, if you prefer that model, I don't. or another model of the higher self that, that guides us. And then we cross the threshold into the special world, into the trance world, into the active dream world where we can meet things and we have tests, allies, and enemies that we meet. Now hypnotically we can set up this adventure for a person to go through at a visceral uh, deep trance identification level where their imagination is intensely involved so that they can have these characters show up. I, uh, typically you would set up two to three allies and two to three enemies for them to go through. And these each represent part of themselves or their own inner resources. For instance, the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy is of course the id, or the, I'm sorry, Dorothy's the ego. Toto's the id. Uh, but Dorothy's the ego and she meets uh, resources of herself, uh, the lion, the tin man, and the scarecrow. Okay, They all represent different aspects or resources of herself as do the obstacles she meets. So the flying monkeys, the uh, apple throwing trees, the poppy field, the, those obstacles all represent the inner anxieties of herself. And uh, a client, when you run them through a deep trance identification to the monomyth, you can have their unconscious create a story that has these representations. Uh, and you set it up and then you let that cycle run, that script run in that approach. Now, uh, the seventh stage would be the approach to the inmost cave, which is the approach to the cave to go underground deep into the unconscious where one's deepest fears and anxieties ride. Um, the supreme ordeal is when we meet that and we deal with that, uh, the big boss, so to speak. And of course, that leads us to the reward uh, where we seize the sword or we seize the elixir and we run back to the road back. And we may have a moment where, in Jungian terms, an alchemical uh, process of, of being consumed, being consumed, the prima materia is consumed and out of those ashes is resurrection or change to the resurrection scene and finally the twelfth stage is the return with the elixir where we just we assimilate ourselves our parts back into a whole and it is a changed whole there are a few folks who use the monomyth in hypnosis and they've, they've got some very interesting things that they they have set up for that I would strongly encourage you to take a look at at uh, Joseph Riggio's work but also and yeah definitely Marine Murdoch uh, and if you've been to my webinars before, you've heard me mention her name in other contexts. Uh, but um, Marie Murdoch has some peace on the heroine's journey, as does um, Jean Houston in the heroine's journey. Take a look at that work, Jean Houston especially, uh, which uses the monomyth for helping women identify with mythological stories that are positive in nature and help them tell their own tale. Now, another aspect of using trance to run folks through scripts would be something more generic, and that is identification with the mythic characters or the archetypes of the unconscious, as Jung would call them, archetypes of the collective unconscious. Uh, Campbell's just going to go with archetypes, and we have different archetypes 
that our tale that we live through takes up, and that's the hero and the heroine. Most folks are the heroes of their own story. Uh, most folks can be the hero. Oh, here's a good comment from Nathan. Um, Nathan, you're the only one making comments. Come on, folks, comment. Um, uh, about uh, the innermost cave can be depression. Depression is the innermost cave. Contemplating suicide is the death and resurrection moment in the story. Um, and he also seconds on reading Vogler. I, I strongly encourage anyone interested in any form of literature and psychology to read Vogler. It simplifies Campbell's work. And read the original Campbell. He wrote a lot. I've got a whole stack, a whole shelf of Campbell in my uh, my office. But uh, some archetypes, we, we typically are the hero or heroine of our own tale. And psychologically, that's more productive than those folks who are waiting for their hero to come way, or waiting for their deus ex machina. Uh, I strongly encourage you to hit it hard with... Um, make yourself the hero but in your life map or your life script your own myth you run across other archetypes as well there are people that you imprint archetypes onto which may be fair or unfair for instance a mentor we often have someone who is typically more experienced not necessarily older but typically more experienced who gives us advice on how to handle things in life. I strongly encourage folks, if you don't have a mentor, to, to get yourself a mentor. Have a mentoring relationship with someone who's gone through the sort of things you're likely to go through. If you're a musician, find someone who's a professional who already has done the sort of things you want to do and uh, get advice from them hopefully a mentor who knows what the hell they're talking about. Sometimes people are very happy to be mentors who are, uh, in psychology there's a technical term for them, dumbasses, so they don't give good advice. Find a good mentor, a solid one. Uh, often it's an organic growth anyway. Some folks don't have mentors and they kind of sludge around uh, lost and alone. It's very useful to have a mentoring relationship. Uh, technology being what it is today, we don't have to have mentors who are physically present. We can find folks to mentor us who are um, online and uh, even on YouTube. Uh, you can find folks and get some ideas. Ideally, personally, I like a personal relationship. I, I think that would be worthwhile. Threshold guardians, of course, we consider some folks to guard the threshold and we have to <clears throat> We have to gain entrance into things. Uh, and so we go through all sorts of things. A herald is someone who announces or brings new opportunities. Shapeshifters are folks who seem one thing, but they turn out to be another. And so they may seem to be good guys, but they turn out to be crappy guys. Or they seem to be bad guys, and they turn out to be good guys. Um, Obviously, the character of um, Snape from the Harry Potter stories. Uh, he is a shapeshifter. He seems to be an enemy to, or at least an obstacle, not an enemy, but an obstacle to Harry. And later he seems to be an enemy, but actually he turns out to be an ally. Shapeshifters change. Uh, they change their form. They don't actually change their inner nature as much, uh, but they are often portrayed that way. These are not werewolves. Uh, they're not cursed. They shift. Loki is a shapeshifter. The mythic Loki and the Loki that we see portrayed in comic book and film is a shapeshifter. Shadows represent our innermost desires that we repress and things like that. Um, and of course, Trickster. And Loki is a shape-shifting trickster. Um, we have a comment that Ishtar being a, is a good example. Uh, let me see. Oh, no, let me go back here. Okay. 
Uh, someone would add, uh, the monomyth is a... I'm assuming that, that it's supposed to be good instead of Godo, but a good tool for analyzing and improving stories, but not good to use when writing one from scratch. So don't follow it by numbers. Uh, that's, worth, uh, that's worth noting some folks. If you notice, most Hollywood films now follow the monomyth, and that's because they are doing it by numbers, and it doesn't come organically. Um, and um, that kind of dilutes the power of the monolith, at least in film and literature. And if the monomyth comes organically, it's typically a, a better approach to it. Now, for our little exercise for applying the monomyth psychologically as a metaphor, you can do it by the numbers because the unconscious of the person you're working with fills things in. They fill it in, and, and our purpose, of course, is very different. Uh, Ishtar is, yes, absolutely. Uh, Ishtar is a good example of a female figure who follows the monomyth. She descends into the realm of the dead through the seven gates, has death and resurrection. And, of course, her relationship with Ereshkigal is an interesting one in and of itself. I think her, her sister kind of gets the short end of the stick sometime, but there is that. Uh, now there are of course tales where Ishtar uh, is a figure in someone else's tale, and so the monomyth doesn't quite line up the same for her in, say, the Gilgamesh tale. But uh, for herself, and she would be, and I think, Nathan, you know this, uh, that um, she would be one of my go-to gals for monomyth uh, identification for uh, heroic figures. Uh, but Ishtar, I think she's, yeah, this is Ishtar right here. Uh, and uh, my Freya is somewhere else. I would go with Freya or Ishtar, but I'm weird. Not for myself. I, I, I would say, use the use the myths that work for you. I'd probably go with uh, Odin. Uh, when I do this kind of work uh, lately, I've been glomming on Odin. When I was younger, I was more of a Thor guy, but now I'm more of an Odin guy. I've got the look, and I've got the need for vision enhancement, um, and that sort of thing. And unlike uh, Thor, I, I don't cross-dress too much. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been reading a, a collection of Norse tales recently, and there's a, a delightful one of, of uh, Thor cross-dressing. Um, not, not, not by his choice, uh, the other gods make him do it. He has to cross-dress and uh, get married to a giant, uh, who he then kills. So, hey, Thor. Um, but Loki, I mean, Loki, the best story for Loki is when he has a tug of war uh, with his testicles versus a goat. And that's just, you got to admire a guy who does that. Uh, I really hope they had that in a movie. Yay. Okay, but uh, we can play with these ideas and concepts. Um, we haven't done it for a while for one of the webinars, so we're going to run ourselves through um, a short little example uh, trans session. So, if you would. Now, if you're experienced with hypnosis or self-hypnosis, you can probably, or, or active prayer or deep meditation, you probably can just snap to it. If not, just allow yourself to just drift as best you can and enjoy the experience of really get your imagination intensely involved. That's the trick to this stuff intensification of imaginative involvement, which really means imagine as if it's real. So if someone says, imagine this, feel it as if it's real. Even if you're not feeling it, you know what it would feel like, so imagine what that feels like and feel it. So, sit comfortably. I assume most of us are sitting. If you're driving a car, don't do this. Uh, but Sit comfortably, or if you're lying down, just lie comfortably. I don't know why you would lie uncomfortably, but um, just breathe in deep. 
hold it and breathe out close your eyes and relax breathing in breathing out relax deep deeper deeply relaxed breathing in and out relax deep deeper deeply relaxed one more deep breath in and out relax deep deeper deeply relax breathing in breathing out relaxing more and more and tell yourself that every breath out you just relax more and more breathing in and out Relax and relax and imagine if you would that you can relax even deeper, even deeper now, even deeper, as if you're floating in a balloon and that balloon begins to float deep deeper, deeper into a beautiful valley. That's right. And relax. Deep, deeper, floating free, floating gently, and relax. Even deeper. And as we gently float down, down, deeper down, into the valley, into relaxation, and relax deep, deeper, deeply down. Now we just gently sit down on the floor of that valley and relax even deeper, deep, deeper, deeply relax. That's right. Just relax. And as we're on the floor of the Valley of Relaxation, just imagine, if you will, as you breathe in, you can feel an energy, a connection. Now, I don't know what sort of God or deity or character for myth or story your unconscious would like to identify with but just allow it to happen very gently as you breathe in imagine your unconscious connects connects with a character deity hero legendary figure for a myth or story and imagine your unconscious can connect in a very powerful way. Now, this might be to linking you to the archetype of that figure and the many figures that repeat the archetype over time. Or it may be to a specific script or idea of that character, figure, deity, idea. And as you connect and breathe in, feel the energy of that archetype run through you. 
and allow your unconscious to breathe in that energy as a pure light that goes deep inside to your core where your life scripts and life maps are held. And imagine this positive, archetypal, mythic life map begins writing into that core in a positive way your unconscious has selected to help you allow yourself to live your life in a way that allows you to become the sort of person you wish to be. Connect and feel the change and feel the shift and feel that's right connect deep deeper deeply connected right there now in a moment I'm going to count from five to one and at the number one feel a shift as your unconscious takes that script on board and becomes the sort of person you wish to be. Five, four, three, two, one. Seal the connection. Feel the shift. That's right. Now, in a moment, I'm going to count from one to three. At the number three, your eyes open, you're fully alert, your head is clear, feeling, oh. One, coming back to the here and now. Two, stretching, and three. Eyes open, feeling, Whoa, that was interesting. How do you feel? I hope that was helpful. I hope that was interesting. Of course, you can run back through and do that sort of activity again um, by running the script or process and the way that I just did or add your own tweaks to it, the idea is to identify to a positive myth and have that become a life map. Over the next few days you may notice changes in your behavior or not. You may not be conscious of the changes yourself, but allow them to occur as they do in a positive way. If you find that your life script needs tweaking, you can always run it again. Now we have some more comments from the gallery uh, related to our mono myth. Campbell, of course, regards shapeshifters usually as female in myth, and the shift stood for uh, they shift moods during the month, um, which is, of course, is one factor. Other shapeshifters are are more. Um, plot based in terms of character in the stories and in the tales. Uh, not all of Campbell's shapeshifters, of course, are female. He does uh, look at some male uh, shapeshifters. Uh, men also change their faces, change their colors, uh, not just through the lunar cycle, although many men do indeed have a lunar cycle, uh, but through other aspects and things. Don't assume your shapeshifter is a woman, although sometimes they, they are. Okay. Now, um, Nathan very kindly also comments that uh, heroes in the monomyth are normally male. Uh, there is position for the female mythic cycle. It's more about cyclic changes, about pers preserving the status quo rather than challenging each. Um, 
that's partly because many of the myths we see, many of the monomyth examples we explore, are from patriarchal structures are cultures, cultures where they're male dominated and the hero is uh, typically male. However, there are plenty of examples of female monomyths out there and of female heroines. And please note that while this is mythnosis we're talking about today, about taking the, uh, the myth and using it, myth doesn't have to be um, limited to the past. We have myths today. Star Wars, as Joseph Campbell noted, is a modern myth. Many of our epic films are myths that we can use in this way. It's kind of like um, the myth has expanded. Actually, I just talked about this in, the, um, um, in another channel that I have, and that is that um, uh, myths today may include mimetic entities. Mimetic entities, if you know the Dawkins concept, although I don't agree with Dawkins in many concepts, uh, the concept of the mimetic entity is a meme that is given life its own and is spread through human culture. And uh, when we look at film heroes, a lot of them have become mimetic entities that have a lot of energy funneled into them. We can use those in terms of this process, sort of process as well. You don't have to identify only with the ancient myth, although don't dismiss those myths. They have power, uh, particularly if you're working with ecstatic trance work, um, which is another function. Uh, play with it. And that's what I would say. Play with the whole concept. Uh, have fun with it. You can also do this temporarily, not just a life map for a, for a permanent change. If you are familiar with deep trance identification, you can use it for a recreational exploration. Uh, some of us, when we do stage shows, we hypnotize folks to take on the identity of another person uh, uh, temporarily. Therapeutically, you can use deep trance identification for skill enhancement or for growth and, and learning. Couples will sometimes, uh, there's the, uh, David, uh, I'm, the, the, I'm losing the name, I'm sorry, uh, but uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, case history of hypnosis where uh, one of the cases was the couple who became each other. Uh, where the man and the woman and a couple who were having issues, they were hypnotized so that they each took on the personality of the other person and talked as the other person to one another. Uh, and that was very meaningful for them in terms of changing their perspective on how they saw what the other person was doing and realizing how the other person saw them. And it was, it was very fruitful. And you can play with that. Uh, therapeutically, you can also do it for recreational purposes. I have a friend who I won't, I will not give his name, but he's a good friend and a very good hypnotist who will sometimes, uh, he tells me that uh, he and his wife for intimacy role play will change characters. And so they become characters from their favorite films or from, um, celebrities and they will engage in erotic contexts as these characters uh, just for the experience. And so uh, for mythnosis you can also do temporary, temporary just to feel what it's like to be Thor or feel like what it's like to be Aphrodite or Venus or Freya or Ishtar. Inanna or Athena or whoever you want to become. You can play with these concepts and have some fun as well as use it for therapeutic or life-changing, life-altering, positive ways. I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has been interesting to you. Please let us know that uh, you find these webinars useful. 
And uh, if you would, if you're interested in particular topics, let me know. Uh, I will, I'm happy to play with anything. I do a lot of stuff. Uh, this has been a webinar. We have one each month, at least one a month, sometimes more on Tuesdays for my YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, news and rants on Wednesdays. That's question and answer time. Uh, so if you have questions, just ask away. And Thursday's trance time where we do a, a short trance process and all sorts of things. Please be sure to click subscribe on our web pages, our, on our YouTube channel, and become a member of the web pages. But uh, look around, click that all subscribe. I hope that you have uh, found this useful. And uh, until next time, uh, this is Dr. Brian David Phillips saying, live trance and prosper.